Our sermon text this morning will be from Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Ephesians 3, 1 through 13. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which he had given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I was very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory. This is God's word. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask now that the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts, would be found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our rock and redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Kendra and I have a uh, long ongoing joke in our marriage. And it goes something like this. Kendra asked me a yes or no question. Normally it is a theological or biblical question. She thinks it's yes or no and has a one word answer. And I talk to her for 10, 15, 20 minutes, pontificating on the question giving a what I consider a beautiful, wonderful answer that is going to all her, and when I am done talking, she looked at me and says, so is it yes or no? <laughs> I am one to take winding side trails and explaining something to someone. You know, I have a goal in the conversation, a point I'm trying to make, and I am willing to go down any rabbit trail, any side trail, in order to explain any side point. But after doing my study this week, after studying this passage, I refuse to apologize for my sidewinding trails anymore. In fact, when you take those trails, you are simply following the Apostle Paul. You are simply being Pauline. For almost this entire passage in verses 2 through 13, it is simply a Pauline side trail. Paul is beginning to do one thing. He is beginning to actually pray for the Ephesians. He opens up a prayer for this reason. He's going to pray, but he gets sidetracked. He says, oh yeah, i got to remind you of a couple things before I pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take these <coughs> 13 verses, and he doesn't actually get back to his point. He doesn't actually get back to his prayer until verse 14. And what is he sidetracked by? But we sidetrack by wanting to emphasize that his entire ministry, his entire life for the past couple decades has been entirely for the sake of the Gentiles. And this connects chapter 3, this connects these verses back to chapter 2, especially verses 11 through 22 that I had preached on about two weeks ago. In, verse, in chapter 2, 11 through 22, we saw that those Gentiles who were formerly far off have now been brought near. That Jew and Gentile together are now uh, in Christ one new man. 
that Jew and Gentile together are being joined together, that they're being built together on the foundation of Jesus Christ and built into God's house. They have become his family members, God's family members. They have become God's temple, the place in which God resides, the place in which God's presence dwells in the Holy Spirit. And so God's presence with his people is no longer based on their physical descendants of Abraham. It is no longer based on their outward circumcision status. It is no longer the fact that they follow the ceremonial law, that they eat kosher, that they dress a certain way, that they worship at the temple. But God's people are those who are joined together in Christ by the bond of faith. And so Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, which would be mostly Gentile, and he is trying to remind them, he is trying to drive home the, the reminder of God's great grace towards them. Hey, you Gentiles, in verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2, you Gentiles were dead. You Gentiles had your wholeheartedly following after sin. You Gentiles were wholeheartedly chasing after the world. You Gentiles uh, were enslaved to the devil, chasing after him, wanting to chase after him. But now you are no longer dead. You are no longer slaves. But you Gentiles are now living. You have been brought to life. You no longer desire to chase after sin. You no longer desire to chase after evil. You have been seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And in verses 11 through 22, he, he gets back to God's grace in another way. He says, not only were you dead and enslaved to sin, but you were also outside of this covenant. You were also far away from God. You were aliens. You were strangers. You were outsiders. You did not belong. But now in Jesus Christ, you have been brought into God's house. You have become family members. You have become citizens of God's kingdom. You have been brought near. Those who are outside have been brought near. And so for that reason, Paul says, because of all that great grace that was talked about in chapter 2, for that reason, I'm about to pray for you. But Paul pauses and he sidetracks. He has reiterated the gospel once again to the Gentile, and he also discusses his own unique place, his own unique ministry, his own unique role, his own unique calling in preaching <clears throat> this new revelation, this new mystery, as he calls it, in this passage. And so when we begin looking at our passage today in verse 1, he tell, again, he tells us, for this reason, I, Paul, and we can assume there that he is planning at this point to begin a prayer. If you look down at verse 14, Paul picks up this prayer again. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, bow my knees before the Father. Right, so the assumption is that he's about to begin that here, but he says, I want to explain a few things first. The first thing he wants to explain is his situation that he is uh, in right now as he begins to bow his uh, knees before the Father. And what is his situation? Well, it is that he is a prisoner. Paul is in prison right now. And this is the first real mention in all the letter of Paul's imprisonment. Why does he bring it up now? Well, I think the first thing is that it adds weight to his prayer. Not only am I praying for you, not only am I just going to pray to God for me, but remember my situation, remember where I am, remember what I am, <clears throat> excuse me, where I am right now as I bow before my Father and pray for you. I am imprisoned. I simply, I am imprisoned not for my own sake, but I am imprisoned for your sake. I am in prison on behalf of you Gentiles. So it adds weight to the prayer that he is about to pray for them, that they know how serious and how heartfelt and how important this prayer is for them. And it adds weight to the previous discussion that we had talked about of this Gentile inclusion, that it is not a side issue, that, <clears throat> that it's not something that Paul can simply leave off, but it is something that is so important that Paul is willing to be imprisoned for. What is at stake with the Gentile inclusion is nothing less than the universality of the gospel. What is uh, included with this, what this points to, is God's whole plan to unite all things in Christ. 
And so the Gentile inclusion, which we kind of take for granted, which uh, you might think something that Paul could have just simply left to the side, was something that Paul was saying, I am willing to be imprisoned because of. So think about Paul's situation. We know that uh, from the book of Acts, that Paul was literally in jail, in prison, for their sake. I had mentioned this a few weeks ago, but Paul was in jail because he was accused of bringing an Ephesian Gentile into the temple. He was accused of bringing Trophimus, who was an Ephesian Gentile, into the temple with him. And so that is the reason he is in jail. Very literally, he's in prison for their sake. And we know from the book of Acts that Paul... <clears throat> had a whole bunch of different hearings before a whole bunch of different bodies. <clears throat> he had hearings before the Jewish leaders, that is, before the Sanhedrin, and he kind of gave his, uh, his case to them. Then they took him before the Gentile governors. He spoke before Felix, the Roman governor. He spoke before Festus, who was Felix's replacement. He spoke before King Agrippa. And finally, he has taken to Rome. He has appealed to Caesar. He says, hey, I want Caesar to hear my case. And so he's been taken to Rome, and he's staying in private quarters, and he has a guard, and that's where the book of Acts ends. I was talking to Micah yesterday and showed him how the book of Acts ends, where Paul's just kind of sitting around waiting to hear from Caesar. You don't really get a good ending. Paul's just kind of sitting there, preaching the gospel, waiting for Caesar to have some time to hear his place, to hear his case. And so it is uh, probably in this situation that he is writing. He's in Rome. He's able to kind of come and go. He's able to preach. He's able to have visitors. He's able to write. But he is still in prison and cannot get out until Caesar will hear his case. And so it's here in this situation that he is writing to the Ephesians. Now, how could Paul describe his situation? Well, he could say, well, I, Paul, am a prisoner of the Jews. It was their accusations against me that landed me in prison. I, Paul, am a prisoner of Rome. There was a Roman garrison that came out and arrested me. I, Paul, am a prisoner of Caesar. I am waiting for Caesar to call me and hear my case. But John MacArthur notes that although he was arrested on Jewish charges, Paul did not consider himself a prisoner of the Jews. Although he was arrested by Roman authority, he did not consider himself a prisoner of Rome. Although he appealed to Caesar, he did not consider himself Caesar's prisoner. Note what Paul says. He says, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ. Now we got to note the grammar that Paul was not saying, I am a prisoner for the sake of Christ, on behalf of Christ, but rather... He, he was a prisoner for the sake of the Gentiles. It was for their sake that he was there. He is saying literally, I am Jesus Christ's prisoner. I am his prisoner. He is the one who has put me in this place. Now, how can Paul say this? Well, Paul, throughout his ministry, has always referred to himself as Christ's slave, as Christ's bondservant. We see this in Romans 1. He says, I, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6, he says, You have been bought with a Christ price. You are no longer your own. So throughout all of his ministry, when Paul was, was free, when he was not a prisoner, he had considered himself that he was bought with a price, that Jesus Christ was his master, that he was a slave of Christ, that his entire life was under the control of Christ. And if that's true, then when Paul becomes a prisoner, it's very easy to understand that it was Jesus Christ who has imprisoned Paul that was the cause of his imprisonment. And I think this can lead to a bunch of ways to, to apply this. Following Jesus may mean and will mean suffering in this life some more than others. Church history tells us that Paul was beheaded, that Peter was crucified, that John was exiled, but died of old age. But no matter what the situation is, Jesus' answer is always to you, follow me. At the end of John 21, when Jesus and Peter are, are reuniting after Peter betrayed Jesus, he's telling, he kind of gives Peter a hint, hey Peter, the end of your life isn't going to be nice. You're going to 
Go with men who take you where you don't want to go. And Peter's first, aunt, first response is, well, what about John? What's going to happen to him? All right, what did Jesus say? Don't worry about him. Worry about yourself. And what you are to do is to follow me. Another thing is that, think about Paul's situation here in Rome, uh, in prison on behalf of Jesus Christ, but then consider everything else that we had been talking about for the last two chapters. Think about all the good news, all the riches of God's grace, all the gospel that Paul has been giving to us in all different directions, in all different ways, reiterating the same point over and over that we have all these great gifts because of Jesus Christ, because of God's goodness. And so we know that we can have a fixed hope, that we can have a great joy, that we can have a, a great hope despite any of our present circumstances. And this helps us to, to understand the importance of our perspective. To understand that whatever your circumstance is, whatever situation you find yourself, is a situation, it is a circumstance in Christ. It is a situation that is in Christ, that is for Christ, that Christ is bringing you towards in his, in his wisdom. And your calling is always the same, to follow him. And so we are all slaves, we are all bought with a price, and so your circumstance is a circumstance that Christ has called you to, and we need to live it out faithfully. Paul says he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Your calling might be a wife and mother in Jesus Christ, a husband, a father in Jesus Christ. We are all children of Jesus Christ. You are a nurse, a cook, a teacher, a retail worker, a student, in and for and of Jesus Christ. And so no matter what your situation, no matter what your circumstance, know to whom you belong. Know the future that has promised you. Know that he has bought you to a price. You belong to him. And so Paul says that he was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He was Christ's prisoner for the sake of the gospel. He is in prison because he has spent his life taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And it's at the end of verse 1 that he really breaks off his prayer. He's, I think he's still kind of intending to pray here. And In the ESV Bible, you might see a little dash at this point showing you that Paul is breaking off <coughs> his thoughts. And so he breaks off his prayer and he begins to talk about his relationship to the gospel and his relationship to the Gentiles. Paul assumes that they had heard about his ministry, that they had heard about his testimony to God's grace for him, that they had heard his presentation to the gospel. So we know from the book of Acts that Paul had spent a lot of time in Ephesians, but after Paul had left, the churches have grown, the churches have developed, the churches have brought in new converts, and so probably not everybody in the church would have been personally acquainted with Paul's teaching. But he said, I'm assuming that you all have heard about me, that you all know my story, that you all know my teaching, that you all know my gospel. And he says, what I am, he says, the ESB translates, a steward. This is a word that's something like a, a household servant. It is someone who is responsible for taking care of something that belongs to somebody else. Right? So he has a master. The master says, hey, this is my thing, my possession, my house, and your job is to take care of it, to steward it for me. And what is he a steward of? We said he's a steward of God's grace. That's the grace of God that is embodied, the grace of God that is displayed, the grace of God that is proclaimed in the gospel. And so Paul says, my role is simply to be faithful to my master, faithful to Jesus Christ, and to teach, to preach, to proclaim, to write the free grace of God that is given to us in Jesus Christ. That grace that is available to all who believe in Jesus Christ regardless of their ethnic status, their economic, racial status. It is available to all who repent and believe the gospel. And Paul then goes on to explain that he is a steward, and this gospel of free grace was given to him by revelation. He speaks of a mystery that was revealed to him by divine revelation. 
Now, when we think of mystery, we often think of something that is uh, dark, something that is unknown, something that we don't get to the end of the story. But really, the way Paul uses it in the New Testament, a mystery is something that has already been revealed. So the mystery is something that in the, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, we're not quite sure. We don't get the whole picture. But now, because Jesus Christ has come, we are now revealed. We now understand this mystery. And he tells us in verse 6 what the mystery is. That the Gentiles are now fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise of Jesus Christ through the gospel. So you might ask, well, in the Old Testament, we see all of these kind of promises. We've read Genesis 12, and we see in Genesis 12 that God doesn't tell Abraham, hey, Abraham, I'm going to be a blessing, so hoard up these blessings and keep them to yourself, your family, don't spread them out anywhere. Right now, he says, through you, I am going to bless all the nations, all the families of the earth. In Isaiah 49, he, uh, there's a prophecy that, I will make you a light to all nations so that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. In Hosea 1, he says, those who are not my people will be called children of the living God. In the Psalms, we have these great promises that the gospel will go out from the east and the west and the north and the south. But Paul says that this mystery is not known to other generations the way that it is now revealed through the apostles and through the prophets. So what is it exactly that is not known? If we have all these great promises that the gospel is going to go throughout all the world, what do we not know? Well, I think the assumption in the Old Testament is that the Gentiles are simply going to be allowed to join the Jewish nation. But the truth is that both Jew and Gentile both must die and both must become one new man. I think the assumption in the Old Testament might have been that Gentiles would be second-class citizens. Yeah, they're allowed to be brought in, but they're still not quite as in as the Jewish people. But the gospel is that they are not second-class citizens, that they are family members, that they are heirs to the promises, that they belong to the same members of the same body. And then we get a couple of, of interesting things. He says that they are heirs together with, one body with, partaker of the promise with the Jewish believers. And Paul's point is that this is no less gospel, this is no less good news than everything else that he had been talking about up until this point. And so the mystery is that there is a complete union of Jew and Gentile as they have complete union with Christ their Lord and Savior. And Paul tells us this was given to him by divine revelation, I think a, a, a hint of the Damascus Road experience. And he tells us that we receive this revelation, how? He says, when you read this, when you read what I have spoke, what I have written to you, when you read it aloud in your churches, you understand the revelation that God gave to me. So pay attention to the word of God, pay attention to the reading and preaching, and we come to understand deep insight into this gospel. In verse 7, Paul begins to talk about his unique ministry, that he, was, uh, that he was made a minister of this gospel. A minister is simply the same word of a servant, one who acts on the command of others. So Paul, in both talking about being a steward and a minister, is saying, I am simply a servant of God. He is my master, and I am doing what he has commanded me to do. I don't do anything of my own authority, but the authority that was given to me by Christ to preach his gospel. And look at how he talked. He said, not only am I a, a servant, but I am the least of all the saints. In fact, I'm the one that was persecuting the saints. I am so unworthy of this grace, he says, the grace to become a servant of this good news. In verse 11, Paul backs all this good news up to the eternal plan of God. All of this, all this good news, all this reconciliation with God, all this reconciliation of Jew and Gentile, Paul's calling, Paul's commission, the church displaying to the cosmos the good news, all this is rooted in his eternal purpose. 
And then he ends in verse uh, 13 by, or 12 and 13 by pointing that in Christ all Jew and Gentile together have boldness and confidence act, uh, access to the Father through faith in Christ. Faith is what brings us near Jesus. Faith gives us access to the Father. And because of all this, Paul says, because of all this gospel, because of all this uh, commissioning, because of the way God has used me, do not lose heart over what I am suffering. It is for the glory of the Gentiles. He's telling them, don't get down, don't feel ashamed of me, for I am suffering for your glory. One commentator says that the chains of Christ are far more glorious than all the golden crowns of the richest kings of all the earth. Now we think about applying this text, I first want to point at Paul's description of what he preached in verse 8. He preached the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches of Christ. John MacArthur comments again that the purpose of every preacher is to declare these riches, to emphasize to the church, to, to teach believers exactly how rich they are in Christ. And so have we grasped this richness? That you who were dead are now alive. That you who are strangers are now children. That you who are slaves are now priests and kings to God. That you who were once riddled with sin have now been made clean. That you who were hopeless now have unfathomable hope. That you who had no hope after death know that it only gets better after death, and that after death comes resurrection and eternal life. And we discover all these riches only by giving ourselves over to God's revelation, only by diving into his word, only by giving ourselves over to the study and understanding of what Paul, even here, has written to us about these riches. But we can spend our entire lives sitting here in church week by week, reading the Bible again and again, and never even begin to comprehend the riches, the good things that we have in Jesus Christ. Another thing that we can think about with this passage is that Paul was always seeking to preach what I call the full gospel. Paul was always seeking, always wanting uh, to preach the whole gospel, even when it caused offense. Paul didn't preach a watered-down gospel, but he preached in all of its richness and in all of its implications. And when you read the book of Acts, what's interesting is that so often Paul can be preaching the gospel, preaching, and he preaches Christ, he preaches Christ's resurrection, and things don't get bad when he's preaching to the Jews until he gets to the point of the Gentile inclusion. We see this in Acts 13. Paul and Barnabas in Antioch, they go into the, the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he just simply begins in the Old Testament and starts preaching the gospel. He preached the Old Testament, he preached the covenants, he preached Christ, he preached Christ's death and resurrection, he preached that through Christ's death and resurrection we can have forgiveness of sins. He warned them. He said, hey, don't be like your prophets and scoff this. Uh, uh, don't heed the words of the prophets and do not scoff at this good news. And there's a really good response. The Jews kind of follow him out of the synagogue, really wanting to have a chance to talk to him one on one. But the next Sabbath, the, the news of Paul's preaching went out over all the city and the entire city, including Gentiles, gathered to hear the preaching of Paul. When the Jews saw this crowd, they saw the Gentiles were also included, that Paul didn't kick them out, but that he included them in his message. They became jealous and then began to fight Paul. The Gentiles rejoiced in this gospel, and the Jews stirred up persecution. In Acts 22, after Paul's arrested, he says, hey, can I talk to the crowd? He gives his testimony. He tells them exactly what he has gone through, how he met Christ on the road to Damascus, how he had this experience, and they're listening, they're giving him uh, good attention. It seems like everything's going well, until he gets to the point where he says, God told me, go, for I will send you far away 
to the Gentiles. The response at this point, it tells us up until this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and they said, away with such a fellow from the earth, he shouldn't be allowed to live. And so Paul was allowed to preach. He was allowed to preach true gospel. But as soon as he got up to the point where, hey, Gentiles are included, that's when actual violence occurred. The point I wanna, what I want to point out here is that if some of our evangelical leaders were around back in the day, they would say, Paul, you're not in prison for preaching the gospel, but you had to go and, and point to and form those pesky Gentiles into the same body as the Jews. Paul, can't you just stick to Jesus? Can't you just stick to the death and resurrection of Christ? Why do you have to go and make that full application and talk about how this is even good news to the Gentiles. They would say, Paul, they don't hate you for the gospel. They hate you because of your social views. Why don't you just focus on what's central, the good news of forgiveness? Why do you have to go and push what you know is going to offend people, especially, Paul, after they just rioted and wanted to kill you in the temple? Why do you have to go and preach to the wrong kind of people? But Paul refused to preach a message that was anything less than good news to all people. He refused to preach a gospel that was anything less than the breaking down of the barrier of Jew and Gentile. A gospel that required uh, anyone to do anything else besides repent and believe this good news. Paul refused all of that. And he was willing to be beaten. He was willing to be in prison for this insistence that the gospel is not just Christ's death and resurrection and forgiveness, but Christ's death and resurrection, breaking all barriers to anyone approaching God besides faith in Jesus Christ. This means that it is good news for the Gentiles. And so we in this day are urged in all sorts of ways to kind of trim off the rough edges of the gospel. We are urged to be gospel-centered in such a way that the gospel never causes offense to anyone. We are called to preach a, we, we are told to preach a gospel that will always cater to those in power and never cause us trouble. But we should note that there is no person who is excluded from hearing this gospel, that this gospel is good news for everyone. But this gospel is good for sinners of all sorts. That there is no but at the same time that there is no one whom repentance is not required. This gospel calls out all to come and all to repent and believe. This gospel must go out to those that we consider our enemies. This gospel is for racists and anti-racists, for Antifa and Proud Boys, it's for LGBT folks. This gospel is for woke mobsters and this gospel is for Trump deplorables. But every single person must be called to believe the gospel of Christ crucified and also repent, laying down their former identities. They must kill the sins in which they are involved. They must repent of our hatred, of our pride, and all the ways we have rebelled against God. The gospel we preach is not just Christ crucified for sinners, but also Christ ruling over all. It is not just that Christ is a savior who forgives us, but Christ is a king who rules over us and demands everything from us. We don't preach a gospel that has Christ who forgives and not a Christ who also sanctifies. We don't preach a gospel that is Christ the savior and not also Lord. We cannot preach a gospel that reconciles us to God and leaves us unreconciled to each other. We cannot preach a gospel that leaves us as individual people and does not bring us into a body with others. We can't preach a gospel that leaves off offense that might cause to human pride and ego. Paul was willing to be in prison and ultimately die for this wholehearted, full-orb gospel that by God's grace we should also embrace. We should all be so thrilled by the unsearchable riches of his grace. We should all be so captured by the unfathomable riches of uh, wisdom of the gospel 
that we would also suffer too. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Father, we do give you thanks for this gospel. We thank you for Paul's wholehearted preaching of the gospel, that he did not chop off the rough edges that would cause him trouble, but that he preached the gospel of God's grace to all, Jew and Gentile. Father, we pray that we would also be those who reach out and preach this gospel to all, call sinners to repentance and repenting ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat>